Hi, good night everyone. Uh, my name is Anura and I would just like to thank you for joining us in what we hope would be the first of many sessions. Um, I want to acknowledge our sponsor company, CVRS. CVRS is the proud sponsor of the Trinidad Eye Hospital. Of course, you're familiar with our services, but we've recently upgraded and updated some of them. So the first is our new phone number through which you can access all our locations. We have even updated our subsidized pricing program, which enables persons to access our services at discounted prices. And finally, we're very pleased to launch our new website, so go check it out. Uh, we just have some basic house rules for this meeting. Uh, please <laughs> mute your microphones. Use the discussion chat to type any questions you may have as presenter may answer during or after their presentations. During our panel discussions, please raise your hand to speak and tell us your name. And most importantly, please participate. This is intended to be a very interactive session. So finally, I would like to introduce our moderator and key speaker for tonight, Dr. B. Vineet Kumar. For those of you who may not know him yet, he is one of our consultant ophthalmologists and is extremely passionate about reducing avoidable blindness. He joined us earlier this year, but before which he was at Wirral University Teaching Hospital in the UK for 10 years. He is and has been the clinical lead for our diabetic eye screening program since 2018. So I'll now hand you over to Dr. Kumar. So please enjoy your session. Thank you. Thank you, Anura. That's a lot of stress on me, actually. It is not really. All right, OK. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome um, to the program. This is the um, launch of our lecture series um, for our colleagues in the community. Um, so let me just kickstart my presentation. I see my colleagues are out here, Dr. Bola and Dr. Dwarka. Gary, hi. All right, let me get my presentation up. Okay. So um, I just would like to say that um, the program this evening would um, start off with me presenting um, some information about our diabetic eye screening program. And um, subsequently, we would have our trainee ophthalmologist, Dr. Badesi, presenting some cases. And um, subsequently, we would have a discussion panel with our uh, consultant colleagues and yourselves involved on various themes, which I will um, display as we go along. Right, so we use the theme of um, come, learn, share, and repeat. And this is something that is um, close to my heart. And I believe firmly that um, um, we continue to learn as we are students um, going forward. So our diabetic eye screening program has been active for about 2.7 years now. So through this presentation, I want to take you through our program, its objectives, and the audit that has been done up till now. And very interestingly, the collaborations that we have been able to achieve this far, and we seek out for more as we go along. As I said, it's taken baby steps over the last 2.7 years with a definite mission of reducing avoidable blindness from diabetic retinopathy in Trinidad and Tobago. Our vision to screen persons with diabetes in Trinidad and Tobago and development of a robust register within the service. The objectives of the DESP program um, has been um, mirrored along the UK diabetic eye screening program. Uh, the aim is to provide evidence-based population screening program that identifies the eligible po population and ensure effective with maximum coverage. It's safe, effective, 
of a high externally and independently monitored and quality assured, which is the core of the program, which we call as the governance. This program allows for the earlier appropriate referral for those who need to come in to be seen by the doctors, effective treatment and improved outcomes which are delivered and supported by suitably trained, competent and qualified clinical and non-clinical. Emphasize program is led by very competent, accredited um, team who have done a commendable job and, and they continue to do a, a commendable job. And within our objectives is to have an audit embedded in the service. As I said earlier on, our program mirrors the UK NHS diabetic eye screening program. We've used this particular grading, which gives us a fair idea of what to advise people when they come in for their assessment. Particularly, as we know, most diabetics develop some kind of retinopathy when they've been diabetic for about 10 years. When they have no retinopathy, you can confidently tell them that there is a less than one in 50 chance of referable eye disease within three years. If there is background retinopathy in one year, just over one in 20 chance of referable eye disease within three years. But if they have background in both eyes, there is a one in four chance of referable eye disease within three years. Very important to talk about this background retinopathy because if changes are made by the individual, then they could have regression of retinopathy. And this is what we have seen, and this is what we wish that all of us participate in communicating. Anything beyond a background retinopathy, whether it is non-proliferative or maculopathy or proliferative retinopathy, have got different risks of progression and subsequent loss of vision with the time. We will answer all your questions. Um, we will take them after each presentation, um, if that's okay. So our screening program um, aims to complete this protocol within the zero to four weeks from the time they are screened. We um, um, screen anybody over the age of 12 years relevant medical history is captured, visual acuity is taken, patient is dilated, who proceeds to having photography, and this information is stored on IPAX software, and subsequently grading and reporting of these things are done, and information is fed back to the patient, either via um, provided email or through um, paper copy of the report. And the patients who need to turn up to the hospital are advised to do so with relevant information. We all have seen this in our practices, what pictures look like. So this is the kind of pictures that we are able to take with our cameras, which are all, both have been fixed sites and mobile sites throughout the country at this point of time, in addition to our four um, sites that we operate. We always take an anterior segment photograph to identify if there is any media opacities like cataract. And if there is retinopathy, obviously we are aware that this is a referable retinopathy. And of course, this is something that we wish to avoid. And unfortunately, you will probably see through this evening's presentations that we tend to see more of these things um, than the background retinopathy or no retinopathy situation. So the first audit that we have done so far in 2.7 um, years, including the COVID era, we have um, managed to screen 2,490 patients. We had invited about 3,300 patients. We have 76% uptake. We see the various sites, San Fernando, Freeport, Maribel, and St. Augustine. But what is fascinating to note is our outreach clinics have also achieved an 85% reporting of the patients. And we find that patients are from throughout the country and they are a good mix um, present around. So we have patients within our own practices, which is, as you all know, is heavily retina biased. And within our clinics, the patients that were noted um, to have diabetic retinopathy of which 
percent had sight threatening retinopathy and 14 percent had background retinopathy. Um, 34 percent had other problems such as cataract and the largest group amongst the others was glaucoma. This is a more important uh, group that is new patients completely to the program. We had 756 and 15 percent of them had sight threatening retinopathy which needed referral into the service which is about the same as international figures that we note. Background retinopathy is about 10 percent. Nearly 40 percent did not have any retinopathy. Again, the big chunk is 37 percent um, of other problems of which they are primarily glaucoma, um, uh, cataract uh, and other situations that these patients come with. To Talk about the collaborations that we have managed in the last um, 12 to 18 months. The most recent has been our um, MOU signing with um, DAT to expand our screening services to all the DAT centers, 25 of them in the country, and have a regular DAT clinic in its main head office in Shogones. This was signed on World Side Day last week. We are working with um, the police service and we hope to expand providing services to all the other um, providers of essential service within Trinidad and Tobago. Our team have done a commendable job in working with regional corporations and have been able to, um, even during COVID times, have been able to go out and do clinics in these regions. So the main purpose of these collaborations, the purpose of doing all this work is towards the development of a national diabetic register, which allows us to provide a holistic care with all other providers um, for the persons with diabetes. Reduce number of eye surgeries, particularly such as vitrectomies on a national scale and reduce the burden within the public system. Improve quality and length of life for persons with diabetes who manage their health proactively without progressing to sight threatening retinopathy. It is important to support them and to actually um, allow them to live uh, uh, life um, full of vision. And opportunities for education within the public health system is what something that we have noted would be a very big thing using these collaborations and reach the message out that we are in partners with everyone to reduce um, blindness. So this is my presentation about the diabetic eye screening program. Right, let me come back to, right. Any questions that we want to take at this point of time with regards to diabetic eye screening program? Uh, I'm sorry, Jan Boehringer. What, what is that? I'm not sure. That this is. This is Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. And how do you well, plan to do your, your education online? Or? So, we have in the past done um, um, actual meetings, public meetings. Uh, but currently, we hope to, um, in the COVID era, use the virtual media if possible to do that. Okay, all right. Thank you. That was what? my question for the time being. Okay, 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 okay. Anybody else has any questions? Dr. Bola and Dr. Dwarka, any comments about uh, the um, screening program presentation? Or shall we um, get to the next presentation? Yeah, I, I
non-insulin non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus for 10 years she's also hypertensive she has no past ocular history her best corrected visual acuity with pinhole was counting right and counting fingers on the left her iop using tonal pen was 16 on the right and 18 on the left so the diabetic eye screening program team went on to take some fondus photos of this patient and this is her right eye and and these are some other images some other uh, aspects of the fundus of the right eye here and the left eye and we'll be going into more detail of the findings further down So, given the history and the symptoms the patient was presenting with, also the fundus findings that the diabetic eye screening program team found, patient was referred to see the ophthalmologist within one week, which she did. When she presented to us, her examination findings were as follows. Her anterior segment findings were bilateral cataracts, um, and her anterior segment photos her, anterior, her posterior segment uh, findings were as follows. So this is her right eye. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on here in this right eye. So if you can see my arrows here, there'll be arrows pointing at the different um, areas that of, of interest. So first of all, the, her disc margins, they are a bit blurred. It's hard to discern where the disc is, where the optic disc is. And these black, these two black arrows, they point to fibrous tissue there, extending from the superior and the inferior borders of the um, optic disc. Following the superior and inferior arcade, there is also a fibrovascular component evident. And it forms a circle encompassing the macular region. Adjacent to this ring of fibrovascular tissue, there are pale areas you can appreciate here which signifies that there is some, some, uh, some level of retinal traction. These arrows here point to areas of blood hemorrhages, which uh, signifies leakage and also ischemia. And in the center of the macular region, there was also macular exudates present. On the left eye, there's also a similar findings that were found on the right eye and also other interesting findings. So at the disc, there are abnormal new vessels, or what we call new vessels at the disc, which is a part of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. We can also see that there are new vascularization or new vessels elsewhere at the superior arcade, and there's also less seen at the inferior arcade. Now you see in these two, uh, these two areas here, this one this is the first one. This is what we call vitreous hemorrhage. And this other darker area here, which we call a boat-shaped lesion, and it's darkened in color when compared to the vitreous hemorrhage, is what we call a subhyaloid hemorrhage. And we then proceeded to do our OCT of her eye. And OCT is very helpful to us as they provide a detailed picture of the macula, and they provide us um, specialized images of the macular region to pick up maculopathy. So here we can see these blue arrows, they point to areas, these white areas here are just um, inner to the retina that there is some debris or vitreous hemorrhage. Here's this black arrow points to the fovea. And interestingly, the fovea looks okay, it looks intact. The structure looks good and there's no edema seen. And on the left eye, these white areas we can see here are exudates or chronic exudates because of diabetic retinopathy. This is what we call an OCT angiography, which maps the vasculature of the retina. But in this case, this was a bit unreliable due to the opacities of the vitreous. On the, left, on the right eye, it's the same issue. So patient was assessed as having bilateral cataracts, bilateral proliferative diabetic retinopathy, left vitreous hemorrhage with subhyaloid hemorrhage and bilateral, traction, bilateral tractional retinal detachment. And her plan from that visit was to do left uh, vitrectomy surgery as well as right vitrectomy surgery. 
So from this, right? Yeah. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. So from this, this simple visit to the diabetic eye screening program, this was the outcome of this patient's treatment surgery. So before we move on to the second case, um, if um, thank you, Vikash, for the first case. Um, this is the scary part of diabetic eye screening program. This patient was um, walking about doing her daily job, um, but she pitched up at the eye screening, and this is what it is. The team actually sent me a WhatsApp of the picture on the day that was done. It really, um, really troubles me to see that this is what the situation with some of the patients are. I'll probably bring in Dr. Bola, who's there, um, to ask him um, his thoughts on um, anything else that need to be, um, and what is the um, way forward for this patient? Yeah, uh, this is an interesting case, uh, Billy, because when you look at the, the vision, I, I would have expected that the macula would have been detached. But when you see the OCT and the macula is attached, sorry, because if we operate on the eye and we clear everything up, the vision may not improve very much. So the prognosis in this case, even with surgery, doesn't look so good because most likely the macula is ischemic. And it's, it's a little bit of a shame we couldn't get the OCTA clearly because I think it would have shown macula and foveal ischemia. Because if you look at it, you can actually see through the blood, see through the cataract. So you would not expect calm fingers vision in, in the eye. So unfortunately here, I think you have a lot of foveal ischemia. And uh, the visual prognosis, even with surgery, would have to be guarded. So very careful about that. What was the age of the patient? He's 50. He is a 51, 51. year Yeah, so, I mean, a really young uh, patient. And from my experience with the young diabetic, surgery works really, really well for this group. They usually have a, a 95 to 99% success rate with vitrectomy, so like this. And we see that the, uh, in the long term, they're hardly likely to develop any more traction on the retina after surgery. They're very unlikely to have any more vitreous hemorrhage. And they usually start to develop other problems, like renal problems that affect them but not usually ocular issues. So I, I think the younger the diabetic and the, the earlier we go into the eye, uh, the better. Even this eye, I think it's bad. It actually not as bad as it looks because you just have a little bit of tractional retinal detachment in and around the phobia and uh, sorry, the macula. And what makes it look a little bit bad is that you have a lot of hemorrhage around, which is really uh, good for vitrectomy because vitrectomy is very successful at removing hemorrhage. So although this might look bad, we're able to stabilize these retinas very well. The other thing is once we're able to treat the retinas, I noticed that the perfusion within the macula improves over time. And I think that's due to the the vascular endothelial growth factor stabilization. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, yeah. Dr. D wants to add anything to that. Dorian, um, do you want to add anything to what Ronnie's just said? No, I think we're, I, I'm all right at this stage, but um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Let's go to the second case. So this is, um, yeah, the first case is interesting in that a patient has walked in with a what we call as proliferative diabetic retinopathy with tractions. And as Dr. Bola has just pointed out, um, being a 51-year-old patient, um, early um, vitrectomy is what has been offered to this patient, removal of cataract. We might potentially give a chance. Does anybody have any questions about this particular case before we move to the second case? 
Yeah. Okay. When I wanted yes. to ask, when you do the program, um, the screening program, how, how many patients, what percentage of patients present like this to you? So um, our team has uh, been wonderful in looking at the referrals into the eye clinic. Um, we have had about 60% um, of the patients referred to the clinic um, coming in, and 10% of those patients with sight-threatening retinopathy have been listed for vitrectomy from the outset, from screening program. That's a considerably high figure known to international um, um, uh, publications as such. About 10% needed injections, about 6% needed um, uh, laser treatment, and that's the kind of treatment that these patients have needed from the screening program referred with site threatening retinopathy into the clinic. Okay, interesting. Right here, Vikash. So, for my second case, was a 67-year-old yeah. East Indian female who presented to the DAS program for her annual eye screening. Patient complained of blurred vision in both eyes, which was noted five months ago. She had no other associated ocular symptoms. Past medical history, she is a type 2 diabetes mellitus for the past 20 years on insulin. She has no past ocular history. Her visual acuity was best corrected with a pinhole of 0.4 on the right and 0.5 on the left. Her IOP using Tonopen was 15 on the right and left. Again, Fonda's photos were taken by the e team and these were their findings of the right and the left eye. So given these findings, a patient was then again referred to see the ophthalmologist within, uh, uh, within the month for treatment or follow-up. And on examination findings, when she presented to us, these were our findings as follows. Her anterior segment was okay. She had cataract surgery in both eyes before. And her, her posterior segment, her fundus examination and slit lab examination, showed these white, these yellow spots dotted around the macula and the right eye, um, as shown by the arrows here, which signifies exudates. And also, there were also uh, blood hemorrhages uh, at the macula. On the left eye, we see a similar pattern of uh, macular exudates, what we call a circinate pattern. These yellow lesions here, they form a circular uh, a formation, which we call a circinate. Um, one is over here and another one is over here. So given these findings, we then proceeded to do an OCT, uh, OCT with an OCT angiography which maps the macula and can give you a more detailed um, uh, story of what's going on there. And this was the OCT of her right and left eye. On her right eye, there were intraretinal cysts as demonstrated by these um, arrows here. Uh, you can see in the top image that there is a bi, um, a double cyst. And in the, infra the image at the bottom shows that there's one cyst there. These white lesions over here, again, signifies the exudates, the chronic exudates that was seen in the fundus photos. Here we can see an area of what we call subretinal fluid.